And so Joshua part two, finding God's power as God's general. Now Joshua's part in the story of God's people is, is really, really important. Joshua is the one character in the Old Testament that's a major leader of the people that shows no flaws. The Bible doesn't say anything about him slipping up. It doesn't say anything about him being unfaithful. It shows him as a faith, as a strong general when he first shows up in Exodus, it shows him as Moses' assistant and bodyguard. It shows uh, Joshua as the new leader of the people. He becomes a leader of Israel upon the um, near death, uh, close to the death of Moses. Moses commissions him in the, in the uh, sight of all the people. And he becomes the conquering general of Canaan. And so Moses serves as the transition between the exodus from Egypt, the wandering in the um, desert, and the conquest of Canaan. He's the transition between Moses the lawgiver and then all the judges of Israel that will take place in the promised land. So he's a very important transitional figure. He's a very important leader. And um, he is the one that really has to charge ahead no matter what's there. You remember in the opening verses of Joshua, the book of Joshua, there's four or five times where the Lord says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Now, when we get to the parts of the story I'm sharing today, Joshua is strong and courageous. He found courage in God's presence. And now, as we look today, we're going to talk about him finding power through God's presence, uh, finding power, uh, God's power as the commander of God's army, as God's general. However, first, Joshua has another encounter that, that uh, pushes him into a new understanding. And this is a, one of the important verses in, or the passage of just three short verses in the book of Joshua that we should note and pay attention to. Because you remember the first thing they had to do, they crossed the Jordan, they crossed that on dry ground. Uh, Joshua was given the ability to, uh, by God to command that the waters would stop. God stopped the waters and the people walked through on dry ground. The Ark of the Covenant stood in the riverbed, the, the stones of remembrance were set up and the ark was brought through on the other side and then the waters flowed again. And now they were on the west side of the Jordan and they needed to begin their conquest. And Jericho was the big city that was nearest, that was the first place they had to go. Uh, but in the meantime, they had to try and figure out the lay of the land. And in one of these, Joshua himself, Took, out, took off to take a look and see what was up in terms of what they would have to face there. So it's, it's, um, it's probably at night or early morning, and he's off to take a look himself. And we read then in Joshua 5, 13, these words. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand and Joshua approached him and asked are you for us or for our enemies well that's a valid question but the reply was neither I have now come as commander of the Lord's army I, I'm not sure how you would feel at this point you you're looking over a city that you need to conquer. You come to a mighty warrior with a drawn sword and you ask whose side you're on. And he says, well, I'm not on your side or the other guy, I'm on God's side. I am the commander of God's army, drawn sword in hand. Now that's an important verse because we need to understand that with 
God, we don't order God around. God has his plan and his agenda and how he fights the battles behind us, in front of us, for us, is up to God. We invite his presence. We open our hearts to him. But when we're talking about the Lord's army, we're talking about what God will do and how God has planned it. Joshua encountered the commander of the Lord's army. This was a little bit like Moses encountering the burning bush, the angel of the Lord that was in the bush, because Joshua said he needed to know what to do. Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in homage and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? And the reply was, the commander of the Lord's army said, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did that. We don't have a record of commands that came from this representative of God's army. We simply have the encounter, the encounter. And so Joshua had an encounter with an angel of God that created holiness where he was. And Joshua taking off his sandals and with bare feet sinking his toes into that ground of holiness, he also was committed next step to the Lord and to the Lord's purposes. He met the commander of God's army. And God's army said, I'm not on your side or their side because I'm on God's side. We must always remember that we might cross a line, even if we begin on the side of God, we might cross a line ourselves if we're not careful. And God is the one who is the overruling power here. Not us, not our purposes, not even what we understand God's design to be, but it is God himself. Well, this encounter is, is one of those important reminders that Joshua is part of God's plan for the conquest of Canaan. He has met the holy general of God's armies, not Israel, by the way, God's armies. And he has responded to God's presence there. That's important because it's time for Joshua to lead Israel in conquest, which is really his role. Now, of course, you know the story of what happened next as the spies were sent to Joshua. They were sheltered by Rahab. The people of Israel um, got the word back from them and, and the protection for Rahab. They marched around the city seven times in silence. And on the seventh time, the priests blew the ram's horn, the people shouted and the walls fell down. And then they went in and destroyed the city and just saved Rahab and her family for that. And so that was the first conquest. And the conquest of Canaan went on. There were a few hitches um, in that because the Israelites hadn't quite figured out that when a command was given that was a command that came from God, it was important to follow it. And Achan's family found that out when he took plunder, plunder from, um, from Joshua and they lost, or he took plunder for himself and they lost the batter, battle at Ai until they had to regroup and do that again. Well, they did that and they defeated them and they defeated also Bethel and some of surrounding towns in that whole process. Then a group of five kings got together to fight against the Israelites. The kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Yarmouth, Lachish, and Eglon formed an alliance. They laid siege to Gibeon because Gibeon had a treaty of peace with Israel. You remember the Gibeonites who came and they, they tricked Joshua into giving them a treaty of peace by saying, oh, we've come from a long way off. They had their moldy bread, they had their, their worn out clothes and they had everything else to say, it's been such a long journey. But we know that you're strong. We want, a, we want a treaty of peace with you. And so it was granted to them, but it was from the Gibeonites who were right, right nearby. 
And so this became a problem for them later on. However, they were able to kind of make use of the Gibeonites as water carriers and woodcutters for them for the rest of their days in the promised land. However, at this point, these five kings amassed their armies together from their cities and they laid siege to Gideon. And so Joshua had to come. And that meant that Joshua was going to have to face this axis of nations that was here. As soon as Joshua heard of it, he set out against them from Gilgal. And in Joshua 10, 8, we read this. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them, for I have handed them over to you. Let, not one of them will be able to stand against you. Don't be afraid of them. I've handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. Now, that's kind of good news if you're the commander of the Lord's army, because you've got five cities coming against Gibeon, and, they, and now the armies of Joshua were going to come upon them. Well, the, the, um, the armies of Israel came and they faced the battle. And the scripture says that Joshua caught them by surprise after marching all night from Gilgal. Now, I don't know about you. If I were a soldier marching all night, I'd rather have a little rest. But these guys went right into the battle. They went right into there because that was how they kept the surprise. They didn't camp. They didn't set their fires or anything else. They marched and they marched right up to the siege. They pressed that battle. And uh, we have to understand that this wasn't just about Joshua and the Israelites. This was a battle in which the Lord God of Israel supported the army of Israel, not just in power for the Israelite soldiers, but also in reserving some glory for himself. And in this case, it's because of what God did from the clouds against the allied kings. So all of Israel marches from Giz Gilgal, they march all night, they come to where these five kings from some of the fortified towns around have besieged Gibeon, and they caught them by surprise, and when they pressed the battle, they won. And in fact, all of those armies in their defeat fled before Israel. Joshua 10, 11, as they fled before Israel, the Lord threw large hailstones on them from the sky <laughs> along the descent of Beth Horon all the way to Azekah, and they died. More of them died from the hail than died from the sword of Israel. You see, God reserved some glory for himself in the defeat of the kings. Joshua wasn't in charge of hail. He wasn't in charge of the clouds. He was only general of the armies of Israel. So they caught him by surprise. They routed them. And God not only helped Joshua but also made sure that the Israelites knew that God had fought the battle to win. Not a battle that took place in a few minutes. It was a hard one and an important battle. In fact, this battle was so hardly fought, so much so that in order to allow Joshua's Israelite armies to prevail, we had this word that the sun stood still. This is the same event, the hailstone event, the five kings, the siege, all of this, you know, the stories are all uh, pushed together on this. And this happened in answer to God, Joshua's prayer. Joshua 10, 12, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to the Israelites, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the presence of Israel. Sun, stand still over Gibeon and moon over the valley of Aijalon. And we read that the sun stood still. And the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on its enemies. Now, isn't this written in the book of Jashar? So the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed its setting almost a full day. The book of Yashar that is mentioned here is not part of the scriptures. 
but it was some kind of historical epic that outlined amazing things like this 40 hour day that God gave Joshua. It's a lost book. It's mentioned over here, only here. And it's important to know that this event was important enough that it showed up in the great stories of the day that were surrounded, uh, that had gone with the people in that land that were part of the Israelite story and part of uh, the story of those around them. It's hard for us to say more about this than what the scripture says in Joshua 10, 14. There has been no day like it before or since. When the Lord listened to a man because the Lord fought for Israel. Interesting phrases because we know that Moses had a, a uh, face to face conversational relationship with the God of the universe. When Moses would go to the tent of meeting, God would come down in the cloud and then the presence of his glory was such that uh, Moses would come out shining like the sun himself to where he had to wear a veil over his face. And uh, uh, that encounter, the scripture says that Moses, God talked to face to face as a man does with his friend. But here, it says there's never been a day when, when Yahweh listened to a man. Joshua's in kind of a unique position. As one of God's unusual characters, Joshua has God's ear because of Joshua's own faith and his reliance upon God. See, he prays in the presence of all the Israelites, God answers the prayer that the Israelites might be strengthened, that they would experience power and courage, and they would be able to go ahead. Now, Joshua didn't have the same kind of interaction with God as Moses did. But he had that ability to know, that ability to have faith, the ability to ask God, to know what to ask God for. That's part of the praying in the will of God is knowing what to ask God for. Because when we know what to ask God for, then God is already ready to give it to us. And that's, that's kind of the way Joshua was. He knew what to get, ask God for and he had faith God would give it. Joshua was a prayer warrior whose warrior needs were met in God's abundant supply. He, he was successful because as a prayer, he was a warrior. And as a warrior, he relied on his prayer. God was good to him. Joshua faced the kings, the armies, the cities uh, um, in, in the south of Judah. He completely destroyed them. And the record reads in Joshua 10 40. So Joshua conquered the whole region, the hill country, the Negev, the Judean foothills and the slopes with all their kings, leaving no survivors. He completely destroyed every living being as the Lord, the God of Israel had commanded. And in this first war to take the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, we read that Joshua conquered everyone from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza and all the land of Goshen as far as Gibeon. Pretty large area there. Joshua and Israel, however, didn't immediately occupy the cities for the land had not yet been apportioned to the various tribes of Israel. And you don't really want to do that because you don't want to lead to an early civil war if one tribe had to be displaced in order to put another tribe into that same walled city that they decided to set up. So they returned to camp at Gilgal, the armies rested, and they re regrouped for a bit. And next was a conquest of a very large Axis army made up of the northern cities. And this was a big fighting force that covered the battlefield and was supported by chariots and ca uh, cavalry. And God told Joshua not to be afraid of them. And Joshua surprised them at Merom and chased down the fleeing army because the Lord handed them over to Israel. Then they took the cities where they'd come from and they were allowed by God to plunder most of them and take the livestock. The scripture records that in Joshua eleven fifteen, 15, just as the Lord uh, had commanded his servant Moses, Moses commanded Joshua. Joshua. 
And this is what Joshua did, leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Well, that's why we read that Joshua conquered all that he met. Joshua was never a loser in these battles, for Joshua was on the Lord's side. In these first conquests, as the Canaanites were completely overwhelmed wherever Joshua went, the list of big victories is given in uh, Joshua eleven sixteen. So Joshua took all this land, the hill country, all the Negev, all the land of Goshen, the foothills, the Arabah, the hill country of Israel with its foothills. From Mount Halak, which ascends to Seir, as far as Baal God in the Valley of Lebanon, at the foot of Mount Hermon, he captured all their kings and struck them down, putting them to death. And so with all of these victories by the Lord's general of Israel's army, contained in just a couple chapters of the Bible, it can be easy for us to think of as, as something that happened like a blitzkrieg, sudden and overwhelming. Well, it wasn't quite that simple or quick. There was a lot of land, there was a lot of opposition and a lot of work to do. And some of these victories meant the armies of Israel had to keep up the pressure. And in fact, it says in Joshua eleven eighteen 18, that Joshua waged war with all these kings for a long time. It was a hard fought victory. It wasn't gonna be easy to take this place where these lands had been, um, occupied for so long. And the general had to keep his troops motivated through it all. We get a hint later that this took at least years, perhaps even decades to accomplish, facing such fierce invaders that the Israelites were at that time. We, had, we read that no city made peace with the Israelites except the Hivites who inhabited Gibeon. All of them were taken in battle. And there was nothing nice and clean about the battles. The truth is, this was kind of a genocide, but it was directed by the Lord to get them into the promised land. And Joshua eleven twenty says, it was the Lord's intention to harden their hearts so that they would engage Israel in battle, be completely destroyed without mercy, and be annihilated just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, these are some of the words that in our modern day, we think, why was genocide? Why was genocide commanded by the Lord? Well, the reason behind all of this was the idolatry of the land. It was the fact that this was a land that had already earned the death sentence of sin. This was the land that had refused to look to the creator God, which the presence of that God was, um, was uh, seeded among them by Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, who traveled among them and whose uh, ancestors were um, buried at the oak, the cave by the oak of Mamre. And uh, uh, there was that seed of Yahweh already there, but they had not taken that up. They had not believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they had already earned the death sentence of sin. And Joshua was the tool that was used by God to carry this out. Now, do you remember the spies that 50 or 60 years before were afraid of the giants in the land, those called as the Anakim? Well, they didn't pose much of a problem because only a few were left after that in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod, which would be the ancestors of Goliath a couple of hundred years later. That's uh, also in chapter 11 of Joshua. But finally, Joshua's battles were over and he could retire the army for now because victory in Yahweh brought some rest, which is kind of good news. Now, we have Caleb coming up at, uh, at the end of uh, chapter 13, which we haven't quite gotten to yet. And he's asking for the hill country. He says, look, I'm 85 years old. I want to take the land. And, uh, you know, he says, my eye is not dim. My strength is not weakened. I want to go. But a, a couple chapters before that, we have that Joshua was starting to get tired. It was a long, hard battle. In Joshua eleven twenty three. 23, 
it says that Joshua took the entire land in keeping with all that the Lord had told Moses. Joshua then gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And after this, the land had rest from war. And so then the land was allotted. The cities were resettled with the Israelites. But there were many cities that Joshua had not waged war against yet. There's only so much that can be done in one battle-hardened general who led most of these battles on foot. And the Bible records that it's time for Joshua to retire. Because here's the thing. Even though the full extent of the promised land yet remained to be taken, we have this. Joshua was now old, Joshua 13.1, advanced in age, and the Lord told him, you are old. Well, you know, that's always kind of good when God tells you you're old now. You have become old and advanced in age, but there's a lot of work yet to do. There's a lot of the land that remains to be possessed. Time for Joshua to retire, but still in what remained were all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Misrephath Ma'in, all the Sidonians. There is much to be taken, but God said, I will drive them out before the Israelites. Only Joshua, you distribute the land as an inheritance for Israel as I have commanded you. The whole of the promised land is theirs for the taking, even though it might be hard won, but now the rest of the taking had to happen by those who would uh, be given the inheritance. The responsibility would fall to the tribes who inherit the land to secure their cities and borders. Although the conquest of the heart of the land had given Israel a strong foothold, so much more would have to happen as the Israelites took control of the land occupied by centuries, four centuries by the Canaanites before. God was giving rest to Joshua as general, but retaining him as a sort of governor as he carried out what he had promised, and it was time to divide the land. Joshua 13, 7 gives us the word that from God, therefore divide this land as an inheritance inheritance to the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. The others, you remember, were given their inheritance on the east side of the Jordan in the, the Moabites in Edomite territory that was there. So time to divide the land. He became kind of a general or a governor and all of that as the land was given to the tribes of Israel. Well, now as we close this up, the message I want to share with this is that Joshua found all that he needed in Yahweh God. God started this by saying, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. And Joshua stayed strong. He stayed courageous. He stayed faithful. He found courage. He found wisdom. He found power to overcome. He found the God that would fight the battles with him. And he found that God would sometimes fight the battles for him. But always he find, found that God's guidance would hold him together and hold the nation together. And the message of the book of Joshua was all of this happened because Joshua was faithful. That was Joshua's part, to stay faithful. God's part was to provide power. God's part was to provide direction. God's part was to become the overpowering presence for the people of Israel. And Joshua stayed faithful. There's battles we have in our own lives. There's struggles that we have all the time. It can be struggles that, that happen politically or nationally or personally or racially or socially or even in our own families. Those battles are there all the time. And the word of the Lord to us is be strong and courageous for I am with you. And the example of Joshua is stay faithful and God will have opportunity to fight with you, to be in you, to fight for you, that you might give him glory. And I pray that that example of Joshua would encourage you. Joshua was faithful. Would you too be faithful to God? Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for 
the wonder of your presence, for the goodness of your grace, and for the power of your spirit and your word. Help us to be like a Joshua, faithful and true, unstained by the sin of our own device, and instead, with courage, fight the battles that you choose for us to fight. And Lord, in those battles that we are in, we need your help, we need your power, we need your presence, we need your purpose to be fulfilled. It might even be a personal bout, battle with a cancer or an illness, a family issue. It might be an issue that comes because even of the color of our skin or an issue that comes because of the language we speak or an issue that comes because of the political views that we hold or an issue that comes because of the uh, advancement of forces that rise against. But God, we trust in you to be faithful to us, help us to be faithful to you, that you would receive the glory. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.